My name is Bevan Cohen. You already got that. I'm from Small House Farm, which is a sustainable homestead project in central Michigan. There's a picture of my house right there. Now, I like to show people a picture of my house uh, at the beginning because when I tell people that I'm from Small House Farm, inevitably everybody tends to think that I live in a little tiny house or something. And that's not the case. It's a regular sized home, as you can see here. Um, small house is less about the size of the building that we live in, and it's more about our philosophy on life. We believe in small slow intentional living uh we're on a dead end dirt road we're across the street from 1100 acres of forest so we have the opportunity to do a lot of foraging out there for our uh, food and medicine and that sort of thing our actual property that we farm on is about three and a half acres that's the whole thing that's, that's the buildings the woods and the growing area so it's a pretty small space we do a lot a lot going on in, in a very small area and one of the things that we grow a lot of is tomatoes it's one of my favorite things to grow so I'm excited to be talking about tomatoes with you guys. Here's a quick plug while we're here for uh, my podcast. If you like plants at all, and obviously do your master gardeners, right? You would totally dig the podcast. So here's just a quick shout out. I'll give you a second to remember that. <laughs> Write that down or whatever. All right. And then here's a plug for this book, which many of you may be familiar with. I know that you guys have a, a number of your local libraries now, um, thanks to the generosity of the master gardener. So that's very, very cool. So this book, is a month by month guide to growing vegetables. Um, and it's far more in depth than anything that I'm going to be able to get into today, but I'm really going to try to dig into some cool tomato stuff for everybody. Now, before we get into growing the tomatoes, I want to take a little bit of time to just talk about tomatoes, where they come from, how they came to be. See this tomato here on the slide. This is your, um, your typical grocery store tomato, right? And we all know that the grocery store tomatoes are good for nothing, right? They're del not delicious. They're, um, well, they're good for storage. They'll sit on the shelf for a long time, but they're essentially like styrofoam, right? Uh, not what we want. So how in the world did we get from these wonderful heirloom tomatoes that we enjoy in our gardens that you're going to be able to buy on your plant sale to these, well, styrofoam, terrible tomatoes at the grocery store? How did that even happen? We're going to talk a little bit about that how the tomato came to be the way that it is. You know, it's fair to say that the tomato is America's favorite fruit. Now, we may not think of the tomato as a fruit, but we know botanically it is, right? And you see these two products here, um, ketchup and salsa. These are the two most popular condiments in the United States. And it tends to go back and forth from one year to the next, which one's the number one condiment here in the States, whether it be ketchup or salsa. Number one, number two, it's kind of a dead heat. Between these two condiments americans consume literally millions of gallons of tomatoes every single year hands down the absolute favorite tomatoes even work its way into the pop culture of america um you gotta remember war and his uh line of campbell soups i had um read that andy warhol was inspired to make these paintings because he ate campbell soup for lunch every day for like six years straight or something crazy. And he was so inspired by all this tomato soup that he painted this line of pictures. We're not going to come back to Andy Warhol in this presentation, but we will come back to Camp Bell's tomatoes. So remember that we'll come back around to it as we go. We all know the round red tomato, like in that first picture and what they offered the grocery store. But if we could go back in time to the closest wild relative to the tomato, where tomatoes all originated from, it would actually be a fruit that looks just like this. Not a big round red tomato, no, but a small yellowish orange fruit. Very, very tart, sour, not really enjoyable to eat, very, very small. This is where the tomato originally came from. And the tomato originally came from um, what we call Mexico, the southern part of Mexico, and the northern part of South America as a wild plant. This is where the plant grew, right? So let's follow the journey of this plant from this little sour fruit all the way to the tasty tomatoes that we like to grow in our gardens. First, this is a big thing. So the tomatoes existed here in the Americas for a very, very long time, right? Um, and they were small little fruits like we look like, or like we just looked at. And they weren't really palatable to people, but birds enjoyed eating them. If you're familiar with birds, you know that birds love to eat things that are color red or orange, that sort of thing. So nature makes these fruits these colors so the birds will consume them. And as the birds fly, they drop the seeds, right? A uh, seed dispersal mechanism. And these seeds of these tomatoes eventually started to move north from South America into a Central America, into Mexico. And what we discover is that as these tomatoes moved further north into slightly different climates, 
they changed. They evolved. They adapted. Tomatoes will quickly evolve and adapt to whatever climate they're in. As they move north, they got a little bit bigger. Sometimes they got a little redder. They got a little bit sweeter. But they're still pretty small, still pretty sour. Well, then this guy comes along. You might be familiar with him. Christopher Columbus. And Christopher Columbus shows up. And one thing that Christopher Columbus likes to do is take things from people. So he took a bunch of things, including tomatoes, with himself back to Spain. Now, Christopher Columbus was Italian, but the Italians weren't going to fund his trip. So he got King Ferdinand and the Queen to fund this trip to the Americas. And then he came and took all these things. So he brought the tomatoes back. This would have been, um, well... About 1500 to 1505 was when he finally brought these tomatoes with him um, on one of his journeys back into Spain. And when they got there, and it was amongst the many things that he introduced to the old world, and people were fascinated by him. Now, although the tomato was interesting and unique, it was not something that was considered a food for a very long time. For a couple of hundred years after it arrived in Europe, it was actually considered to be a poisonous plant. For a couple of reasons. One, it's a nightshade, right? And it resembled a nightshade in physical appearance. The plant that it was closely, uh, most closely resembling that the Europeans were familiar with was a, a deadly nightshade plant. So oh, that's not something that we should eat. Then the smell of the tomato plants. And you know, I don't know about you. I love it. You're rubbing up in the tomatoes and that aroma that comes out of the tomato plants. I love it. But the Europeans were very suspicious of such a fragrant plant that they couldn't eat. Right. Oh, this is not something. Uh, it's a novelty, not a food by any means. But people continue to grow it. Some plant nerds like me, maybe like some of you, um, that want to grow things just for the sheer novelty of it. So when people come to your garden, you can say, look at what I got going on here. Look at this plant from the new world. Right. So people were growing the tomatoes. It was, you know, just a beautiful thing to see in the garden. Uh, an oddball type of plant, not a food plant. But then this happened. Tomato makes its way into Italy, specifically into Genoa, Italy. Um, coincidentally, it is where Christopher Columbus was originally from. That was the town that he was born in. Uh, my wife and I were there last year, and I saw Christopher Columbus's house. And it was a very small, um, nondescript little building. But anyways, the tomato makes its way over into Italy. And when it hits Italy, boom, now it's a star, right? People had started to understand the, the food was edible, right? The tomato was edible. Most interestingly, during this Columbus exchange of back and forth to the New World, folks from Europe started to realize that the people in the Americas were eating the tomatoes. They had been eating those tomatoes for a very long time, making a dish that's incredibly similar to what we make as salsa today. Um, they were making it for, I mean, hundreds, thousands of years they were making this. So we see that the folks in the Americas are eating it. Now the most brave people here in Europe decide to try it. And the tomato hits Italy, boom, it explodes. Everybody loves it. It's a big thing. The tomatoes adopted, or the Italians adopted these tomatoes, loved them. Let's think about some of the most quintessential Italian foods. Mm, spaghetti, right? Uh, pizza, uh, lasagna, right? You'd be hard-pressed to pick uh, one of these foods that doesn't in some way involve a tomato, right? Interesting <laughs> to think that before 1550, 1565, there were no tomatoes in all of Italy. Did not exist. So all of these foods that we think of when we think of Italian foods did not exist in any form like we know it today until this tomato arrived, right? Very interesting. Let's keep going with this. This is the tomato. And this is a variety of tomato that you can still get your hands on today. Costa Luto Genovese. And what Costa Luto means is a just descriptor for the shape of the tomato, that round, that ribbed, round, um, scalloped shape of the tomato. That's how it's described. Genovese, because it's from Genoa, Italy, right? So this is a modern tomato, but it is the closest likeness to what the original Italian tomato looked like. Now, let's remember the little orange tomatoes from South America, right? And as they moved north into Mexico, they started to change. Once they moved over to Europe, they started to change a lot, adapting to the climate. People were growing it. They were saving the seeds. They were making selections. The tomato changed by leaps and bounds. There's a place in Italy, in Genoa, where they have a stone sculpture. It's on the outside of a church, big, beautiful church, right? And it's got all these different fruits and things that are carved into it. And there's a carving of this tomato. The very first documented tomato in all of Europe is on the side of this church in Italy. That's what the tomato looks like, exactly like that tomato right there. Great tomato. Love it. All right, let's keep going on the journey. Now, eventually, the tomato makes its way from Italy over here into Anatolia, the area of the world that we uh, now call Turkey, right? And when it comes over here, mm, people seem to really love it here as well. Look at this tomato that I found. I have a friend. His name is Mehmet Oztan. 
Uh, he runs two seeds in a pod heirloom seed company. He is a first generation immigrant from Turkey. And when he moved here from Turkey, he realized that he couldn't find any of the foods here in the United States that he was used to eating in his homeland. So he started this seed business as a way to track down these varieties, save these seeds so he could have the food that he remembered from home. This is one of the tomatoes that he offers. Um, I'm not going to try to pronounce the name of it by any means, but this is a Turkish tomato. According to my buddy, May Matt, this is one of the oldest heirloom tomatoes in Turkey, right? Look at it. Looks familiar, doesn't it? Let's look at this. Look at this. The same tomato to me. Now, I can't say that to my buddy, May Matt, because if I say to May Matt, oh, that's the same tomato. He gets very upset because it's a Turkish tomato. And it's connected to the cultures, the place, the people, the memories, the cuisine of Turkey. I went to his house. He cooked me a Turkish meal. It was delicious. The salad, tomatoes, had tomatoes in it, right? So we know that historically this tomato did not exist in Turkey until almost about pu pushing 1600 here. Um, didn't exist. But it is a part of the culture and the cuisine now, right? Just like when we think about in Italy, the tomato became a part of the culture and the cuisine of the people. Quintessential. The same thing happens when the tomato finds its way to Turkey. Let's keep going. Eventually, the tomato makes its way to India. And there is some scholarly debate on how that happened. Um, whether it came by land or it came by water, there isn't any direct archaeological evidence to prove it either way. But we all know that one way or another, the tomato made its way to India uh, mid to late 1600s, right? Uh, pushing maybe early 1700s. The tomato arrives, right? Nice. Just like everywhere else that the tomato hit, it captures the imaginations of the people, right? The gardeners want to grow it. The people want to eat it. I love Indian food. I go to any town that I go to, I want to go to an Indian restaurant. I got my kids turned on to Indian food. Every place that we go, what is the dish that everybody gets or is familiar with when they go to an Indian restaurant? Chicken tiki masala, right? Or curry, right? Both of which have tomatoes tomatoes in them right and there wasn't even tomatoes in india until possibly 1700 but when we think of the quintessential indian dish chicken tiki masala um didn't exist <laughs> until 1700 right until that tomato showed up and infused into the cultures and cuisines of the people now i went searching for an indian tomato so let's see if i can find an old indian tomato um which took a lot of online searching but look what i found Here's this guy from India. Look at those tomatoes that he's got there. Let's look at it a little closer. There it is. It's called the Kashi tomato. Now, Kashi is just the word in India that they use to describe an heirloom or a heritage variety, right? So this is, according to this company, I found the oldest strain of tomato commercially available in all of India. And look at it. Sure looks familiar, doesn't it? Right? The same tomato traveling all the way around the world. Very wild stuff. Very cool. Very cool. Now, let's come back to the United States. There's a gentleman, his name is Alexander Livingston. And uh, this is not his first seed catalog, but I'm showing you this one because it actually has a picture of him on it so you get to see what Livingston looked like. Livingston was a seedsman. Um, he launched his company, I think it was in 1890. And he is known as the grandfather of the modern tomato. And when we trace tomatoes, modern commercial tomatoes back, they all seem to bottleneck right here with Mr. Alexander Livingston. In 1890, Alexander Livingston introduced the Paragon tomato. And at the time, this was the first perfectly round, smooth red tomato. Remember all those rib tomatoes we were looking at? That was very common. But this round, smooth tomato, unheard of. So thing that was happening in the mid to late 1800s was um, canning food preservation canning uh, of various foods, including tomatoes. And up until that point, it was very difficult to peel the skins off of tomatoes. What with that ribbing and all that sort of stuff. It took the blanching and the peeling, and they basically didn't even have a machine that could do it. They were doing a lot of it by hand. In the early days, I mean, they were banging out the cans by hand. They were sealing them by hand. They're peeling the tomatoes by hand. It was a lot of work, and they were trying to automate things, and they were learning the process of automation. And once they were able to find a smooth red tomato, now they could automate the peeling of the tomato. Game changer, right? So this skyrockets Livingston into stardom, tomato stardom, most certainly. He opens a seed company based off this Paragon tomato. It's a big deal, right? Let's follow it along a little bit more. He did to discover this Paragon tomato 
was not plant breeding as we think of it when you're taking a couple of flowers and mixing pollen and all that sort of stuff. No, what he was doing was growing large swaths of tomatoes, big field of tomatoes, and then just walking through the fields, observing the tomatoes. And just as we talked about with the tomato, the little one, in South America, as it moves its way to Mexico and moves around the world, it slowly changes, it adapts, it mutates, it does these different things. So Livingston would literally find mutations, just genetic differences in his tomato fields, isolate those plants, save their seeds, grow them out again, stabilize those mutations, and create new varieties, right? The very first yellow tomato, big commercial yellow tomato that ever came, Livingston, right? He did all of this simply by walking through the fields and observing it. And I think that's an important thing for us to realize. The wealth of tomato varieties that exist in this world, many, many, many of them have come from simple observation. And this is a breeding technique that all of us can do in our gardens, right? Just simply walking through the garden, observing, looking for something, looking for something in particular, looking for the healthiest plants, selecting those plants, saving those seeds. That's how we get new tomatoes, right? The Alexander Livingston specialized in this thing. Interestingly enough, at the exact same time that the Paragon tomato was hitting in the Americas and becoming the number one canning tomato, almost at the exact same time in Italy, this was happening. The San Marzano tomato, the most well-known canning tomato in the entire world, I'm sure. Um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the San Marzano tomato. There's actually a San Marzano variety that's going to be available for purchase, possibly at your tomato sale, which is very cool. I recommend that you get it because it is a great tomato. Meaty, flavorful, awesome. Okay, and here's an interesting thing that we can think about when we think about local food. Everybody's hot on local food right now, right? You can look at this can of San Marzano tomatoes on there, and you see where it says DOP at the bottom of the can? This is DOP certification. What this is is a certification from the Italian government that this is a true San Marzano tomato. To be a true San Marzano tomato, you have to grow this tomato in San Marzano, Italy, at the base in the field of Mount Vesuvius, grown in the soil, from Mount Vesuvius, right? Gives the mineral uptake, the flavors, the terroir to be a true San Marzano tomato. Fascinating. Now we can get San Marzano tomatoes and we can grow them in our gardens and we can enjoy them and have all of those wonderful flavors. But technically they're not true San Marzano tomatoes, according to the Italian government, unless they're grown in this particular place. It's really interesting to see uh, how particular folks in Europe are about local food. Here in the States, you know, the local food movement's very big. We all want to grow our own food or support our local growers and that sort of thing. But this is something that they've been doing in Europe very well for a very long time. Um, this DOP certification is part of it. Each country in Europe has their own um, little phrase for how, you know, how they describe it. But DOP is the one that they use in Italy. Um, I get a, a, a pasta from Gragnano, Italy. And to be a true Gragnano pasta... It has to be wheat grown on a particular hill by this village, and the water used to make the pasta has to come from the artesianal well at the bottom of the hill in the village. That's the only way it can be considered a true Gragnano pasta, right? I mean, hyper-local stuff. When we were in Italy, I went to a deli, and they had all these different cheeses, and the guy was telling me that all of the cheeses were all made within 25 miles of where they were selling it. And I was like, wow, that's, I mean, there's a number of cheeses all within 25 miles. That's incredible. Don't you have cheeses from other places? And he says, why, why would we need cheeses from other places? We have the finest cheeses right here, right? Think about how local that is. Carbon footprints, all those things. It's already happening. It's, it's absolutely amazing. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, that's going to be my soapbox for this presentation. Now let's talk about Campbell. All right. Campbell's tomatoes from out of New Jersey. This is a really fascinating thing that happened. Look, there's that round red tomato that we talked about at the beginning from the grocery store. How did this happen? How did this come be come to be? So for the longest time in the United States, and when canning was really big, um, when it was really becoming a booming industry, uh, folks were growing tomatoes any place that they could grow tomatoes, right? And they would run the tomatoes into a slurry, load them into train cars, and then ship them to the packing facilities, right? And they would put preservative chemicals into the tomato slurry to stop it from fermenting, to keep it from going bad, right? So it could handle the, the train trip. And that worked out until, um, well, early 1900s, when 1902, I think it was, when the United States passed the first food purity law. Right? And one of the parts of that law was that you couldn't put these chemical preservatives in this food because they thought that it was going to be harmful for people. Um, so now suddenly they couldn't put these chemicals into the tomatoes. 
You couldn't ship the tomatoes anywhere because they'd go bad. If you've ever, you know, had a tomato slurry, um, like if you're saving seeds, it'll ferment within just a couple of days, right? So they couldn't do that on the train cars anymore. So what was happening is in order to do this, they had to grow the tomatoes for the canning very close to the canning facility, right? And Campbell's excelled at this. They were they had it down. They were saving their seeds. They were breeding different tomatoes. At one time when Campbell's was at its peak back in early production, they had a tomato for soup. They had a tomato for canning. They had different tomatoes specifically developed for each application that they had there. And they were paying people to grow these tomatoes very close to the facility. Well, as anything in the United States happens, it just got too big, too big, too big. And they couldn't have, they didn't have the space to continue to grow these tomatoes close. So they said, well, now we got to start getting people growing tomatoes further away. What are we going to do? So they started breeding tomatoes that could ship. Now we couldn't ship the slurry, right? It wouldn't keep, we couldn't put the chemicals in it. But what if I could develop a tomato that could handle shipping? right? Something that was really tough. And then all of a sudden, instead of developing tomatoes for flavor, we started to develop tomatoes for shipability. I want a tomato I can load onto a truck and drive it across the country to the cannon facility, and it's still going to be a tomato when it gets there. And then all of a sudden, we found ourselves in a position where all of the tomatoes started to turn into styrofoam, essentially, right? Those tomatoes that nobody wants from the grocery store. Simple profitability, Oh, that's not the world that we want to live in, though, right? That's why we want to grow our own tomatoes. So an interesting thing happened. As all these immigrants started to make their way into the United States, they started to come with them. Now, Europeans, um, Italians, and the, the folks from, from Western Europe started traveling into uh, New York City, right? That, that, that Statue of Liberty coming into New York City. And on the West, folks from Asia, India, China, that sort of thing, they started coming into San Francisco. And they were bringing all sorts of things with them, cultures and stories and, and seeds and seeds and tomato seeds. And they started bringing all of these different varieties of tomatoes with them. And all of these little grandmas in Italy and all of these folks in India growing these tomatoes, they weren't growing tomatoes that needed to be shippable. They were growing tomatoes that were delicious and awesome, right? So they started bringing back with them to the United States the most wonderful tomatoes. So the tomato had gone from South America, Central America, North America, all the way around the world, and then back to the United States. And what a bevy of tomatoes came back. Every town, every village, every family had their own little tomato that they brought back with them. A wealth of different tomatoes for all of us, saving us all from Campbell's dreaded styrofoam tomatoes. And then there's folks like my buddy Jim Wyatt. Now, this is a picture I took of Jim out in Indianapolis a couple of years ago. I call him Tomato Jim. Tomato Jim is an avid seed saver, most certainly. Um, look at that table, all those little packets. Each one of those little piles of packets is a different variety of tomato. The only thing on his table is tomatoes. That's why we call him Tomato Jim. You could Google Tomato Jim. This guy's going to pop up. Um, Jim keeps... He's, close, he's push, pushing almost 2,000 varieties of tomatoes, right? That's a ton. But even more interesting is all of the tomatoes that Jim offers are from Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky. That's it. That's his specialty. Tomatoes that are local to him. 2,000 varieties of tomatoes local to him, right? Because you realize you got to save these seeds. By saving these seeds, you're saving not only the varieties, but the stories and the history and the culture. All of these things that tomatoes infuse themselves into. Jim's doing some powerful work out there, right? Think about all those tomatoes that Jim has helped to save and share with those communities. Then we got this guy, Brad Gates. Now, Brad Gates lives out in California. He's a friend of mine. He runs Wild Boar Farms. And what Brad Gates does is he's developing what he likes to call the heirlooms of tomorrow, right? He's not saving old seeds. He's a plant breeder. He's developing new varieties. Uh, one of his most famous, there's the Berkeley tie-dye, um, the atomic grape. Uh, he's done some, some wild stuff. Now, Brad does do some intentional breeding, uh, most certainly, but a lot of what Brad does over there is just like what Livingston did, growing large patches of tomatoes, walking around, looking for differences, right? Identifying those differences, isolating, stabilizing, creating new varieties. Like I said, the heirloom tomorrow. So we've got folks like Jim Wyatt that are saving the seeds of yesterday and folks like Brad Gates that are creating the seeds of tomorrow. So that's an encouraging place to be, right? Uh, we could be a part of that as well. When we grow our own tomatoes, we're doing our part to um, save everybody from the dreaded Campbell's tomatoes, right? Let's talk about growing them. Um, you guys had submitted some questions already, and I'm going to encourage you to put some questions down in the chat box as we go. I'm going to try to... Um, 
touch on them with the time that we have. Um, there's going to be a lot that I'm going to say here. There's a lot of stuff that I'm going to say. So get ready to write notes and um, put, put your questions down there, like I said, because I don't know if I'm going to be able to touch on everything, but I want to make sure you guys have everything that you need to succeed, right? So let's start by growing our tomatoes. We're likely going to have to start our tomatoes from seed unless you purchase some uh, tomato plants at the plant sale, which you most definitely should. Um, but you might want to start some tomatoes from seed. So let's talk about tomato seed starting. Now, an interesting thing about tomatoes is coming from Central and South America, they require a long growing season and a, a lot of warm temperatures, right? So where we live, we can't just necessarily start planting our tomatoes direct, sowing them outside by any means. We got to start them indoors, right? So we're going to want to start our tomato seeds about four to six weeks before your last frost date. So check out your last frost date, and we're going to come back to the last frost date here in a little bit. But check your last frost date about four to six weeks before that. That's where you're going to want to start your tomatoes. And we're going to start them indoors in this, uh, what you're looking here. I stole this picture off the internet. There's some things about this picture I really liked, so we could talk about them. And there's some things about this picture I don't like at all. We can talk about those too. Uh, but you'll see that I'm using those trays with the uh, clear plastic dome lid type of scenario. You want to get some of those, those are your friends. That clear plastic dome is essential, right? This It's going to help in a number of different things, um, containing moisture um, and trapping in heat. And we'll talk about all those things as we go right here. So we're going to start our tomato seeds. You're going to need to get a soil, uh, a seed starting mix of some sort. Um, now you can purchase seed starting mixes. Most certainly they sell a lot of them um, online or at garden supply places and stuff. And a lot of them are going to be made with um, peat moss. A lot of people like to use peat moss, but I'm just going to tell you right now, um, scratch that off and don't use peat moss for anything. Okay. Now we like to use peat moss. Folks like it because it's light and airy, fluffy. It's very easy for these baby seeds to get out of, but there's a limited supply of peat moss on this planet and it takes a long time to make. And instead of that, you can get something called coconut core. And core is spelled C-O-I-R, coconut core. And what this is, is it's made from the shredded hulls of coconuts. Um, and there's an endless supply of these. People are obsessed with coconut oil. And the byproduct of that is a huge supply of shredded coconut shells. And it's light and airy and fluffy. And it's a renewable resource. And it's wonderful stuff. And you can buy seed starting mixes that have the coconut core in it, or you can just use the straight up coconut core. And we'll talk about the differences and what we'll do depending on what we choose as we go here. So we're gonna get our light, nice, light, fluffy seed starting mix. You're gonna put it in these trays and then you're gonna plant your seeds just below the surface. The rule for all seeds when you plant them is the width of the seed, one half times that, that's the depth that you planted at. So tomato seed doesn't get planted very deep at all, does it, right? So you're going to want to plant these seeds in there, and you're going to want to water them and keep them moist. And that's why that plastic dome lid is so important, because that peat moss or coconut core, whatever you're using, does not retain any moisture at all. It will dry out, right? So you got to leave that dome on there to keep it moist, to keep that humidity up. That's going to help those seeds uh, germinate. Then you're going to need a heat mat. Critical that we use a heat mat, right? Remembering where our tomatoes come from, Central and South America, they need some heat. A tomato seed isn't likely to sprout until it's at 55 degrees Fahrenheit for a number of days, right? That's like a minimum temperature. So you want to warm them up. So you can buy a heat mat. Um, they sell them at garden supply places. Or if you've got like a uh, heating pad, like you'd use on your, like, you know, your back or your shoulder or something, it's essentially the same thing. So you can use that if you want a heating uh, pad, heating mat, interchangeable. Heat source underneath, tray on top. You'll see these here. They've got double trays on them. And we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit as we go. Once the seeds start to sprout, you're going to want to take that dome off, okay? Get that dome out of there. Because now that the plants have started to grow, if you leave that dome on there, it's going to be too much moisture in there. It's going to encourage fungal growth, bacterial diseases, that sort of thing. So take that dome off, get rid of it. OK, now it's very important that we continue to water our plants because now that they're exposed to the air, that coconut core peat moss is going to dry out very quickly. So make sure you keep them moist and you're going to water them from the bottom. That's why you have that second tray underneath, right? Water from the bottom so they can soak the water up from below. This is very, very important. OK, when you water from the bottom. The roots will grow towards the source of the water, right? 
if they have to work down, they will grow nice, robust root systems working towards that water. If you water your plants at the top, at the surface, those roots have no reason to ever go anywhere to look for water or anything like that, and they won't, and you will have weak, spindly root systems. So don't do that. Water from the bottom. All plants, not just tomatoes, always water from the bottom, right? So your water from the bottom, you got the heat mat. Um, once the seeds have germinated, you don't necessarily need that heat mat anymore. It's really important for germination. Um, once the plants have started to grow, the temperature, the ambient temperature of your home should be plenty warm for these tomato plants. You're going to take that dome off. Now, let's look at this picture. What is one thing that I love about this picture? The fan. Fan, critical. Got to have one. Get a fan. All right? So for a couple of things. The fan, the airflow is going to help cut down on bacterial growth and, uh, and disease, right? So having that fan is, is good for the health of the plants. But also, the fan simulates what would happen in nature, wind, right? And I'm going to hope that you guys don't have wind in your homes, right? So we're going to have to simulate that with this fan. You can have a tomato plant, no fan. It's going to have a thin stem, a fan, just a little bit of stimulus from that fan, He's going to tell that plant, oh, I need a sturdier stem so I can be prepared for all this wind. And it will grow a thicker stem. You'll have a thicker, sturdier plant just by putting a fan on it, right? Very simple thing to do. It's going to be a huge, huge difference in your plants, most certainly. Now, what's the thing I don't like about this picture? The light. Don't like the light, right? Where's the light at? Eh, where's it at? Too far away. Um, now, we could say that, give this guy the benefit of the doubt and say that he moved that light to take this picture. But you know he didn't, because look how spindly and <laughs> leggy those plants are. He's got his light too far away. You want that light right here. I mean, within inches of those plants. And as the plants grow, move the light, right? But keep it as close as you possibly can to those plants. Some people like to buy um, very expensive grow lights, high pressure sodium lights, all these fancy things. And you most certainly can. And if you've got a really powerful light like that, you don't have to be quite as precise about how close you keep it to your plants. Um, but... You can save yourself uh, uh, quite a bit and just go to the hardware store and buy shop lights. They have got shop lights in so many different ways. They've got daylight spectrum shop lights. They've got shop lights for plants, ones that say aquarium, all these wonderful things. They literally have daylight shop lights that they use like in offices. I think it's to trick people into not realizing they don't go outside all day. They just sit in an office. Uh, but it's exactly the light that the sun makes. And you can use those on plants and they work just fine. And they're significantly less expensive. So depending on your budget, um, there's definitely options for all of us, right? So you got the lights close, you got the plants going. Now, one of the beautiful things about a tomato seed, any seed, any seed, is it's got all the energy that that plant needs to really get itself going. You could imagine a tomato is like like a little baby in a box with a little packed lunch or something, right? It's got all this energy in it. The seed has enough food to feed that plant all the way up to its second set of true leaves, okay? Everything that that plant needs all the way up to its second set of true leaves. Once you hit that second set of true leaves, now you got to do something for the plant. Now it needs some nutrients from an outside source. If your seed starting mix is mostly just peat moss or coconut core, there's no nutrients in that at all, okay? So when you hit that second set of true leaves, you have got to give your plant some food. So you can either pot it up into some potting soil, which will have some nutrients in it, which works really well. You could buy a seed starting mix that has nutrients added into it. So it's waiting for the plant when it gets there. Or, um, and this is one thing that I like to do, is I like to give the plants a little blast of nitrogen-based fertilizer. Now it's an organic fertilizer that we use, uh, but it's, it's a nitrogen based. When a plant is young, it needs nitrogen. What nitrogen does for a plant is it encourages cellular growth, vegetative growth, right? So to get baby plants to be bigger plants, they need nitrogen. So it's a, it's like a fish emulsion type of product that we use. It's high in nitrogen, add it to water, put it in a pump sprayer, right? So I can water the plants with it. And what this does is it'll buy me a couple of weeks of the plants still being in that seed starting mix. If I'm adding nutrients to it, the plants will keep growing and they'll be fine before I got to pot them up. I'm essentially just playing the waiting game is what I'm doing here. We will move our plants. We've got a, a small hoop house that we move our plants into that I heat. It's got an electric heater. And I can keep, I get the temperature in the hoop house about 10 degrees warmer than what it is outside, right? So not too bad. If it's 40 degrees outside, I can have it up to 50 degrees. I can put my plants out there. But if it's going to be below 50 degrees, do not put your tomato plants outside, all right? So 
until I can warm my stuff up enough for my tomato plants to be safe, I got to keep them indoors and to save on space because they're going to take up a ton of space. I need to keep them in these small pots. So a little bit of nitrogen fertilizer is going to go a long way to keeping these plants happy and healthy until I can pot them up into something bigger. Once you get them potted up into something bigger and you can move them out your hoop house or whatever it might be, remember, do not take your tomato plants outside into the hoop house until the ambient temperature is at least 50 degrees. Okay. If you take your tomato plants out before the ambient temperature is 50 degrees, you're going to shock them. You're going to slow down their growth. It's not going to be great. Okay. Now we got to put our tomato plants into the ground. This is so important. All right. Everybody looks at their frost date. Remember we talked about, we're going to come back to that frost date. Whatever your last frost date is, that does not mean that it's time to go plant your plants outside. Okay. All that means is that the air isn't going to freeze again. That's all that that means, right? It doesn't mean that the ambient temperature is even going to necessarily be warm enough for your plants, or more importantly, that the soil temperature isn't going to be warm enough for your plants. That is the most important thing. The date on the calendar for your last frost date is just kind of a flag. Oh, now that we've crossed this date, we need to start observing our soil temperatures, okay? So you got to get... A probe, a thermometer. You can buy a fancy one, or you can just use like the uh, meat thermometer. You know, it's got the dial with the metal probe on it, like you'd use in your kitchen. Works great. Stick that thing right into the ground. You want to see the soil temperature this deep into the ground. That's what you look for. That's where the root system is going to be at, right? When you plant your tomato plants outside, down here. That's the temperature that matters. Not the surface temperature, down here. And do not put your tomato plants in the ground until the soil temperature has reached 50 degrees Fahrenheit or warmer. If you put your tomato plants out there sooner than that, you're not giving yourself a head start you know, at all, at all. They're just going to sit there and they're not going to grow. You're getting them in the garden earlier, but they're not going to grow any faster. They're not going to produce any sooner. You're actually slowing down their life cycle. You're better off keeping them out of the soil and waiting until it's time, then put them out. All right, so we're watching the soil temperatures. Soil temperatures have hit what we like. We're at 50 degrees down in that soil. Now it's time to plant our tomatoes out, right? So how are we going to do this? I dig a hole um, this deep. I'm talking, oh, what's that? Foot and a half, two feet, deep hole. I dig a deep hole for my tomatoes, okay? Because we're going to plant them very deep. Um, I'm going to plant them all the way up to the top set of leaves. All that stem's going to go in the ground, right? I'm going to break all those stems off of it, the whole thing going in the ground. When you look at the hairs along the uh, stem of a tomato plant, all those little tiny hairs, they're all making big life decisions. They're saying, well, do I want to be a, a stem or do I want to be a root when I grow up? And if you bury these things in the ground, all of those little hairs will turn into roots and you'll have a nice, robust root system for your plant. Very, very important, right? So again, Dig a hole this deep, my tomato plant's going all the way in it till just the top set of leaves is sticking out. Everything else is removed from it. It's one stem goes in the ground. If you don't want to dig a big, deep hole, if you're growing in a raised bed or something like that, you don't have the, the, the ability to grow deep, go trench. Dig a big trench, and then you can lay the tomato plant in the trench with just the top sticking out, just like that. And all along that, all the parts where the plant are is underground will turn into root system, and it's going to be absolutely wonderful. Now, at the bottom of my hole, I also like to put a bunch of goodies. There's a lot of different things that we could put down in here. Uh, some people like to put Epsom salts. Those work all right. Um, some people like to include coffee grounds. I believe there was a question about coffee grounds earlier. Absolutely. Coffee grounds are about 2% nitrogen. Uh, that has a little phosphorus and potassium too. So absolutely, tomatoes like some coffee grounds down in the bottom of that hole. I'll throw some of my compost down in that hole. And comfrey leaves. And we were talking about comfrey leaves before the presentation started. Comfrey leaves, um, some phytum, a fist and alley. Get it? Get it. It's one of the most important things. It's a perennial herb. Once you have it in your garden, you'll have it for the rest of your days. I'm telling you what. It's a dynamic accumulator is what it's called. So this plant will grow a taproot, a tap way down in the soil. I mean, sometimes 10 feet down, way down there. And they pull all these micronutrients up into the root system, and then it stores it in its leaves, Right. And those leaves break down very quickly. So at the bottom of my hole, when I dig my tomato hole, comfrey leaves, right? Then I'll backfill it with a little bit of topsoil. Then my tomato plants go in. And you can tell the day that the tomatoes reach the comfrey leaves, you can like see the growth. You know, it's, it's absolutely amazing. It is one of the most powerful things that I found to do for my tomato plants to really give them that boost that they need. Deep hole, backfill it with goodies, comfrey, eggshells, 
uh, coffee, coffee grounds, a little bit of topsoil, put that plant in there, buried it all the way up. It's about two feet apart from each other to make sure that they have enough space. We're going to come back and talk about that in a second. And then we're going to mulch our plants. And this is important. This is very important. Uh, for a number of reasons. So mulch is just great, number one, because uh, it helps retain moisture in the soil, right? It stops evaporation, so it keeps the soil moist. It keeps the, the temperature of the soil cooler, which is important for the roots of the plant. Uh, it suppresses weeds. Uh, very, very important, because who wants to keep weed in a nice layer of mulch is, is very good for that. There's a book. There's a lady. Her name was Ruth Ann Stout. You guys are probably very familiar with this book, Gardening Without Work. It's for, It's been around forever. And this lady's whole shtick was mulching the garden. Would mulch her garden so thick with straw, she never watered. Ne never watered. I'll say it again. Never watered her garden. She never weeded nothing. She pushed the mulch out of the way, stick a plant in, push the mulch back. As the mulch decomposed, it feeds the soil with organic material, and she just added more mulch to it. That's all she did. The cover of her book is a picture of an old lady in a wheelbarrow, kicked up having a drink, right? Because that's all she had to do. Mulch is great. It can be your friend. You can see I'm using straw here. That's really nice. Uh, shredded leaves is going to work just fine. Whatever you have accessible to you, a nice thick layer that's really nice for suppressing weeds. But another thing that it's going to do, particularly for tomatoes, is stop splashback of soil. One of the greatest killers of our tomato plants is the fungus that comes from soil that causes blight on our tomatoes. And the way that we can avoid this is avoiding seed, or excuse me, leaf to soil contact stopping the soil from getting on the leaves, okay? So we're going to do this in a couple of ways. Just like I told you, I dig a hole this deep that I put my tomato in. As my tomato is in the ground growing, I will prune all of the branches and everything off of it this high off the ground. It's a stem, nothing else on it, all the way this high off the ground, right? To keep it away from the soil. Then I mulch it really heavily. So that way when it rains, there's not soil splashing up onto my plants, giving them disease. Right, so I prune it way up high like this, mulch it really nice. Then we'll continue to prune our plants throughout the season. Now, in this picture here, you can see I'm removing a sucker uh, from the plant, and the sucker comes for here's the main base of the plant. There's the stem, and then you can see that little sucker growing out of there. And if you pop that sucker off, it's a genetic, genetically identical to the plant. You can pop that thing right off of there, put it in a glass of water, it'll set roots very quickly. I mean, you know, within the week. And then you can plant it. And then you've got another round of tomato plants growing. So that's really nice to do. But if you leave it on the plant, it will try to essentially grow an entirely new vine, a uh, whole new plant going on here. And it will take some of the energy away from the main plant, sure. But the greater issue here is the fact that it grows the plant too thick and doesn't allow airflow. Airflow amongst your tomato plants is very, very important, right? If you don't have places where there's good airflow, then like the dew from the morning or even the rain from later in the day will sit on those plants longer, encouraging disease, killing your tomato plants. But pruning all this stuff out of the way so you get good airflow through there is going to help dry them out. It's going to keep funguses down a lot longer. So it's very important to prune. I've had to prune these suckers off. Some of them got away from me and they get a little bit and they've already got flowers on them. There's nothing more difficult then prune in a part of your tomato plant that's got flowers on it, you know, but you got to do it. You got to make the hard call in the long run for your growing season. It's, it's far better to, to make that sacrifice. Now, if you leave it on there, plants going to get too crowded. You're going to get disease. You're going to lose all of it. Not worth it. Let's talk about harvesting tomatoes. Um, this is the best part. My favorite part, of course, right? Is harvesting and eating the tomatoes. That, that first tomato. Oh my gosh. I just eat it like an apple right off the <laughs> You know, there's nothing better than that first tomato of the year, most certainly. Um, if you look at my basket of tomatoes right here, you will see that most of my tomatoes are green. I pick all of my tomatoes when they are green. All right. Uh, the slightest blush of color. So we'll be clear. The slightest blush of color starts to appear on that tomato. I take it. Get it out of here. Get it inside. Put it on the counter. It will continue to ripen into a beautiful, wonderful, ripe tomato on the counter. I do this for two reasons. Number one. If I leave my tomatoes on the plant to ripen, inevitably critters will get them. Um, in my case, nine times out of 10, I'm pretty sure it's my chickens that are doing it, um, but I've had gophers and all sorts of things come and nibble on my tomatoes. My chickens will go right down a row. Remember how birds are attracted to red colors, right? They will go right down a row and just poke holes. They don't even eat the whole thing, they just ruin them. They just poke holes, holes. Can't have that. 
They don't mess with the tomatoes when they're green, though, right? As soon as that blush of color starts to come on, they're going to be in danger soon. Get them out of here. They'll ripen in the house. But two, and possibly the most important reason for why we do this, all right? All plants, every plant that you're going to encounter in your life, the only thing that it wants to do is produce seed, right? That's what plants do is produce seeds for the next generation. That is their, their priority, their number one mission, making seed. And the only reason that fruit exists in nature in any form, any form of fruit, including tomatoes, is as a dispersal mechanism for seeds, right? So if I pick the tomatoes off the plant before they have ripened, the tomato plant doesn't know that it's made ripe fruit with viable seed yet, and it'll make more fruits. It'll increase my production. You can compare this to deadheading your flowers. You know how you deadhead your flowers to get more blooms, right? The more green beans you pick, the more green beans you get on your plant. Because we're interrupting the life cycle. We're stopping those seeds from developing. Plant freaks out, tries to make more seeds. So by pulling all my tomatoes when they're green, not only do I get tomatoes that don't have holes in them, but I also get more tomatoes by the end of the season. Not bad, right? At this point, we put a lot of work into these. So the more tomatoes we get, the better. Then once you have a ton of tomatoes, you get to learn about processing tomatoes and canning tomatoes. If you're not canning tomatoes yet, uh, what are you doing, right? <laughs> you, you should try. Um, there's nothing better in the middle of winter when you're craving some tomatoes to be able to just go to the pantry and get some of your homegrown tomatoes and make a sauce or a salsa or whatever it is that you desire, soups, whatever you need, right? And that way you never have to go to the grocery store and buy the dreaded Campbell tomato. And you get to learn how to save your seeds. And I'm not going to get all into how to save your seeds right now. We don't have that kind of time. I want to make sure we got time for Q&A. But learning how to save your seeds is one of the most powerful things that you can do. So you guys are going to have a plant sale coming up, right? And you're going to be able to buy all these different tomatoes, peppers. I saw the list, all sorts of cool stuff, right? So get some of these things, bring them home, grow them. And your favorite ones, find the, the healthiest, best performing plant, your favorite taste in tomato, whatever it was, and learn how to save those seeds, right? It's a very simple thing to do. And then you can grow those seeds again and again. Every time you buy seeds, it's like pushing the reset button, right? But when you save seeds from your garden, these plants have started to adapt to your microclimate, your growing conditions, your personal preferences, and you'll get better, healthier, happier tomatoes that you can share with all of your friends just by learning how to save those seeds. So then just like Jim Wyant, Brad Gates, Alexander Livingston, you become a part of that story too by saving and sharing your seeds. If you want to learn more about some stuff that we do, here we're wrapping up so we get to the Q&A. Here's a bunch of my books. Um, the one that might relate the most to right now is the one called Saving Our Seeds that you'll see there. Um, it's a how to save seeds guide. It's a walk you through 43 different species of plants on how to grow and uh, process the seeds. And then, of course, the artist and herbalist is more about foraging herbs. Well, it's something that you guys might be interested in. Um, there's a, a big section on herb gardening as well. But this is the big one here that's going to relate the most to helping you grow the greatest tomatoes and other vegetables that you've ever grown in Wisconsin. And, of course, I've got them. Um, you've got them at your libraries. They've got them at the bookstores. And you can also get them from my website, which is right here. So these are all my links, our Facebook and Instagram. YouTube, the Patreon, if you're into that sort of thing. There's all that stuff. Smallhousefarm.com, of course, is where you can go and check out the books. Um, you can see the seeds that we offer for your gardens, all the different tomatoes that we grow every year, all sorts of cool stuff right there. So that's the whole of the presentation. So it looks like there's quite a few questions. So hopefully we got a chance to jump into some of those. That would be very awesome. Thank you guys again so much for having me. This has been, um, this has been super fun. First questions from someone, I grow 30 varieties in my garden. Are they staying true to varieties or interbreeding? Awesome question. So there's a couple of different answers here. Um, so they're going to tell you, many times you're going to read to keep your tomato varieties pure, that you're going to want about 15 to 20 feet in between varieties to, to cut down on accidental cross-pollination from happening. One thing that you can do to encourage uh, uh not having cross pollination is grow more flowers in between your tomato plants. So these bees have a place to kind of stop off and drop some of that pollen. But what you're going to find with the tomato flower, if you can look up a tomato flower up close is that, you know, in the center of the flower, there's that cone shape, right? Now that's the stamen cone. That's the pollen shedding portion of the flower and the pistil, the pollen receptive portion of the flower is inside of that cone. So it's very well protected. So cross pollination amongst tomatoes like that is very rare. Occasionally in older varieties, you'll see the pistol actually peeking up out of the cone. 
And those varieties are more susceptible to cross pollination, but it's not something you see very often. Um, but if you look around, you might find a few of your flowers that do that. If you're very concerned about it, and if you're growing historical varieties or whatever it might be, I always encourage people to bag your blossoms. Um, you can get those uh, organza bags from dollar stores or wedding supply places, and you can put them over the blossoms on the tomato, which will stop any accidental crossing from happening. And then the tomato that grows is perfectly true to type, no worries at all. Take that bag off. You're good to go. Okay. Next question. What are your thoughts about the new purple tomato from Kathy Martin? Do you know that one? I don't know who Kathy Martin is specifically, but I know all about the purple tomato. Um, and is Kathy Martin asking the question? No, it developed yeah. by her. Oh, okay. So the purple tomato that I'm uh, aware of came from Norfolk Plant Sciences. Um, and they've been developing up for the last 10 years, the genetically modified tomato with the anthocyanins um, in it, which has that purple tomato, which is an interesting thing to think about because it's going to come back true to type. So you could grow this tomato in your garden and save the seeds and continue to get the same purple tomato year after year. But if that tomato cross pollinates with your other tomatoes, then you'll have that GMO patented technology in your tomatoes. And I'm not going to get into naming a bunch of names here, but there was another seed company who recently was going to sell um, seeds for a purple genetically modified tomato. And it had the same genetic markers that the Norfolk purple tomato had in it. And Norfolk plant sciences threatened to sue them over selling these oh. patented mm -hmm. genetics. And they had to pull it off the market. So the thing that I'm going to say about that is if you are going to grow that tomato or share seeds with folks, take seeds from folks that have grown that tomato, there is a possibility that you might end up with patented genetics in your garden that could put you in a world of litigation that you may not want to be in. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yep. Uh, next question. What is the best light bulb for tomatoes? Oh, that's an awesome question. Uh, the best light bulb for tomatoes. So I use inexpensive lights that I get at my hardware store. I've bought the daylight spectrum lights is what they've called them. And they've done well. But the best lights I've grown are the ones that are for aquariums. Um, the big shop lights, the aquarium style shop lights have performed the best for my plants out of all the inexpensive lights. Um, if you got the budget, if you're rolling, rolling in the dough, you, you can buy a very nice uh, so here in Michigan, something that happened um, that was great for tomato growers is the legalization of cannabis. That is something that happened here in Michigan uh, in the last couple of years. And what that means is they've opened a number of grow supply shops for all the folks that want to grow cannabis. And those guys have perfected the art of science of growing plants and tours. You know, they got it down. And a cannabis plant and a tomato plant have the exact same growing requirements. So you're able to go to one of these shops and the types of lights that they use there, the types of fertilizers that they're going to offer in those types of stores are dialed in for tomatoes. Um, and so if you've got that kind of budget, those are obviously the best, but low budget aquarium light. That's been my favorite. Okay. Um, next question to warm the soil would covering the soil with, with black plastic help and then cut holes and put the plants in the black plastic. Absolutely, you can do that. I have some uh, friends that grow a lot of melons, watermelons and things like that. And it's critical to do that, you know, to keep that soil warm for those plants. You could absolutely do that. Um, that's that's a great idea because that, that black plastic also helps suppress weeds, you know, so that's really nice. The drawback to that, if, if, if you wanted to consider drawbacks, is the use of plastic. And many times when we use black plastic and poke holes in it, that becomes a one-time use product that we have to replace every year. So now you're buying the plastic and you're trashing the plastic. So that's, you know, that's a personal choice for folks to make, but as far as the actual functionality of it, it works great. Okay. And we're still in the plastic. I bought red plastic online to put under my tomatoes. It is supposed to be a color temperature that stimulates tomato growth. Absolutely. For sure. I've even seen, um, I was down in Missouri for an event and these folks had, it was like a red plastic dome that went over the tomato plants. The spectrum of light that's allowed to get through this red plastic is very, very ideal for tomato growth. So if that's something that you have, um, yeah, that's it's perfect for tomatoes for sure. 
Okay. Do you use mill organite? No. Okay. I do not. All right. Where do you get I only use I honestly oh. only use for the most part things that we create here on the farm. So a lot of like our art we use um well inputs that we create. So a lot of chicken manure, comfrey, um uh, eggshells, that sort of thing. All right. Is there a place you can buy comfrey leaves or is it something that you mostly grow? I think that there's some herb shops that sell it. It's going to be dry. You know what I mean? So like Mountain Rose Herbs might have it. Um, they're, they're a large online supplier. Frontier Herb Co-op might offer it um, as dried leaf goes. But again, if you've got a, an herb organization, an herb society, an herb event coming up, go there because you're going to find somebody that's got it. And anybody that's got it has so much of it. Um, it spreads so quickly through the underground rhizomes. I, it's, I could go pull just chunks. Of, and you just take a piece of it and like throw it on the ground and it'll grow a plant. It's crazy how resilient it is. Um, so it's it's very easy to get cuttings if you can ask around. When buying plants from a greenhouse that are about a foot tall, should I follow the same technique when planting them in my garden? Like stripping yes. off? Yes. So if we're talking about tomato plants, absolutely. So that's one of the cool things about tomatoes. Like in that picture that I showed where the guy didn't have the light close enough and those plants were leggy like that. With tomatoes, it's one of the few plants you could totally get away with doing it because you're going to bury that plant in the ground anyways, right? So they'll they'll typically recover. Many of the other plants, non-tomato plants that you're going to get, you're going to want to transplant them at the exact same soil level that they grow in the pot. You know what I mean? So you're not going to want to bury them. But tomatoes you can absolutely get away with. So if you're buying anything, yeah, bury it. the deeper you bury it, the stronger that plant will be. Okay. Do you need to take all the suckers off the entire plant or just the first few at the bottom? So there's a few schools of thought on that. Um, I'm going to take most of the suckers kind of guy because uh, they're going to get away from me eventually. And then my plants are going to not get the airflow that I think that they need. Um, I have some friends that pretty much swear by no pruning ever. You know, um, I, I know a guy that he trims all of his tomatoes down to two leads. So he lets one of the early suckers go and then trims the rest of them after that. But that one sucker and then the main run around the plant and he'll grow them. He'll prune them essentially into V's and trellis them that way. Um, and those seem to do really well too. It's, it's all about just all the auxiliary leaves and things. Obviously you don't want to take too many of the leaves because they need that for photosynthesis, but getting just opening that bush up a little bit so it can breathe is that's the most important thing. When you want the plant, when it, when it's getting colder, do you just chop the top off and make it stop or, you know, hot, how do you do that? That's a fun question. So you're going to find too in your shopping list for at the plant sale, you're going to see that they're describing plants in three different ways. You've got dwarf, determinate, and indeterminate. Those are the three styles of plants that's going to be available at your sale. So if you get a dwarf plant, this is a plant that's only going to grow. They're very small plants. They typically grow well in pots. They're wild because they're inky little dinky plants, but they grow regular sized tomatoes on them. But you don't need to prune the tops of them or anything like that. Typically, most of our dwarf plants are going to fall into the category of determinate plants. And determinate plants will grow to a certain height that's determined by the variety to a certain height. And that's as far as they're going to grow. They're going to put out most of their tomatoes in one large flush, and that's going to be about it. Um, so a lot of commercial growers love determinate plants because they're easier to work with. Indeterminate plants, on the other hand, will grow forever until the frost kills them. They'll just keep growing and trying to put on new tomatoes. I've never seen a point in topping any of them. I grow a lot of indeterminate varieties. Many of the older varieties are indeterminate. Just let them go and let them go. And if the cold weather comes and they didn't have time to finish, I'll just bring those green tomatoes in and it's going to be fine. Um, I don't see any point in chopping the top off of them. Okay. Speaking of bringing them in, do you store them on your counter resting on their shoulders, stem side down or on their bottoms? Stem side down. I store them on the counter stem side down. Yep. And I would have taken a bunch of green tomatoes. I used to work at a party store for this Pakistani couple a uh, lifetime ago. And they would bring all the green tomatoes into the shop, hundreds of them. And we would have to, we got paid to work on this, wrapping them in newspaper and putting them in cardboard boxes. And it would always be stem side down, wrapping newspaper, keeping them in the dark. And then you could pull them out and then unwrap them and put them on the counter and they would ripen. And these guys were eating tomatoes in like December, no problem. Um, but always, and they were very particular then, stem side down was the way to store them. So I've just gotten in that habit. That's how I store mine too. Okay. Um, we have one little question about comfrey. Is it invasive?
Yeah. Okay. So that's a good question. So you're going to find some varieties of comfrey that produce seed and the ones that produce seed are incredibly invasive. They will seed all over the place and you'll have comfrey everywhere forever, forever and ever, forever. But they've developed a number of Bocking 13 is the most well-known. And if you buy comfrey commercially, nine times out of 10, you're getting the Bocking 13 um, and it's sterilized. So it doesn't produce viable seed. So it can only be uh, propagated through root. Um, and it will spread a little bit in your garden. You know, it'll kind of do its thing, but nothing that's uncontrollable. I'll just pull it up and move it to a different spot or give it away and it's going to be fine. But if you get a variety that makes seed, you, you're doomed. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, what is the best way to trellis? And we have that as well as do you trellis, trellis non-dwarf plants? Awesome question. I didn't even touch on that at all. Um, so yeah, determinate plants. I will use like a straight up old fashioned tomato cage or something like that. on. You know what I mean? A determinate plant's only going to grow to a certain height. They're very easy to contain. It's not that big of a deal. Dwarf plants, sometimes I use no trellis at all. It'll just grow a little bush on a pot. Not a big deal. It's the indeterminate plants. They're going to need the most trellising. And there's a lot of ways that we can go about doing that. Um, the way that I find works best for me is what's known as the Florida weave. And it's a commercial technique that ironically I learned about in California, not in Florida, but I guess they developed it in Florida and what it is. And if you remember the picture I had when we were talking about mulch and it had the tomato plants with the stakes all kind of down in the row. So what we're going to do, I'll give you a, the best explanation I can here is at the beginning of your row of tomatoes, you're going to put a T post metal T post, a big one, get like a 10 foot big honk and metal T post beginning of the row, pound that thing in right deep, right? And then every couple of plants, you could put a wooden stake, tall wooden stake, four or five foot wooden stake, every couple of plants. And then maybe every six plants, we're going to put another metal T-post. So we're going to kind of alternate like that, right, down the row. Then as your tomatoes grow, we're going to weave, utilizing the Florida weave. Very simple. So you're going to tie your twine off on your big metal T-post at the beginning. And you're going to go on this side of the plant, then that side of the plant, this side of the plant. And then you get to that wooden stake, give it a couple wrap around to keep it tight, and then keep on going, right? Then you come back to the other side, same side of the tomato, you know, same tomato plant, but the other side. So if you're on this side with the string, now you're on this side with the string, right? And you just weave it. Eventually you'll get good at it. It sounds difficult. Once you do a couple rows, you'll it's you can get it pretty quick at it. Um, I can do a hundred foot row right quick, you know, now that I've gotten good at it. What happens is the the weight of the tomato essentially holds itself up. You build a wall where the tomato will just keep itself right up there with its own weight by weaving. Inter, inter, intertwining this uh, string between the plants, the Florida weave. Google it. Maybe there's a video that'll be easier to see. I think we got one on our YouTube if you want to check that out. Um, I find that to be the most efficient way to do it. And then all of my tomato plants at the end of the season, I burn them all. Don't ever compost any of your tomatoes or anything like that. If there's any diseases or fungal situations in your tomato plants and you put them in your compost, you are keeping them and then you will have them again next year. So all my tomato plants get burned. So I got all that twine. I'll just go through and at the T posts, cut the twine, take all of everything, throw it in the fire pit and burn it all and get rid of all of it. Wow. Okay. Um, two cool. questions about commercially available fertilizer and then insecticides, natural insecticides. Do you have any recommendations? Sure. Sure. Um, okay. So commercial fertilizers now, I'm not going to like beat the use organic stuff drum here with you guys. I'm going to assume that those of you that want to do that are going to do that. And whether you want to or not, you'll just do what you want. So I'm not going to tell you either way what to do here. I use organic fertilizers here. And the product that I find works really well is uh, um, Foxfire, I believe it's called. It's got a picture of like a red-eyed tree frog on the bag. It's awesome stuff, you know, but you could buy any sort of commercial fertilizer. What you're going to see is the three numbers on the fertilizer that are telling you the ratios of nitrogen, phosphorus, phosphorus, and potassium that's in the fertilizer. And that's what you really want to look at, right? You know, um, making sure that you're able to, to give the plants everything that it needs through its life cycle. And you can buy a fertilizer that's got all the stuff in it and let the plant figure it out. But I honestly prefer to buy specific fertilizers to utilize throughout the plant's life. So when the plant is young, I'm going to use a nitrogen-based fertilizer to uh, for vegetative growth, right? As soon as the plant starts to flower, 
I stop giving it nitrogen and I switch to a phosphorus based fertilizer because phosphorus for fruits, right? Um, if you just keep giving it a nitrogen fertilizer, a high nitrogen fertilizer, you'll get huge tomato plants, but you're not going to get any tomatoes, right? Um, the plant's going to be too focused on vegetative growth. So understanding sure. the plant's uh, needs through its life cycle and applying fertilizers as needed, I find that, that works the best. As far as insecticides, um, so, okay, I'll tell you one thing that you don't ever want to do, but <laughs> the greatest insecticide that I have ever found to use on any of my plants is tobacco, tobacco tea. It is so poisonous. No plants will go near it. Okay. Uh, no animals, no insects, nothing will mess with tobacco, but you can't use it on tomatoes mm -hmm. because tomatoes are so closely related to potatoes and you'll get potato mosaic virus on your tobacco mosaic virus on your tomatoes if you use tobacco so the tobacco tea works for everything but the tomatoes um it, what i've worked with that seems to work okay for me is i've made a spray from habanero and garlic um seems to work okay for keeping insects away if you're going to have like the tomato hornworm and stuff it's pretty much difficult to, to to get them away with the spray but if you go out into your garden at night with a handheld black light you'll find that they glow and you, you can just go out there and find them. Glow, just pick them off, give them to your chickens, fling them over the fence, do whatever you can, get rid of them. Um, that's just to take care of those that I found. Um, but narrow spray works okay for some insects. Tomatoes don't seem to, in my experience, have as much issue with insects as other plants in my garden might. Okay. Um, two more questions. The second to last question is, what are good companion plants? And I did see you had a pot of something in your tomatoes. Yeah, companion plants. Okay, so a lot of times you'll see that people will tell you to grow basil and tomatoes together because they help each other grow. And I don't know if that's true. I've tried to do it and I've tried to not do it, try to like control test or whatever. And I don't know if I see a difference at all. Right. Some companion plants that I find work in all scenarios is if I'm growing anything that requires pollination by an insect, I grow more flowers, right. To bring in more insects. If I'm concerned about cross pollination between two varieties, I will use flowers as kind of a trap for those insects, you know, and that, so that's sort of a companion planting technique. Um, one way that I found for me and basil and tomatoes to all get along really nice. Like I mentioned earlier, tomato plants need to be about two feet apart from each other when you transplant them out into the garden, but I'm burying those plants all the way to their top set of leaves. Right? So as I'm moving along, there's a lot of empty space in my garden, right? These, I got these little plants, two feet, little plants, two feet. I got four feet between my rows. I started to get like garden related anxiety, looking back at all this empty space. And I start to like, oh, maybe I can get them a little closer together. Oh, maybe, you know, they start. By the end of that row, my tomato plants are way too close together. And so when they're big, mature plants, they don't have the space that they need. They're going to get diseases. I'm going to kill them. You know what I mean? So what I do is I use basil as a companion. I'll put a tomato plant in the ground. And then one foot later, I'll put a basil plant. The next foot, I'll put in a tomato plant. And I'll alternate like that. One foot, one foot, one foot. My tomato plants are still two feet apart right? But by having that basil in between them, it's like a visual cue. It tricks my brain and thinking like my garden's nice and full. I don't need to start crowding things together. And by the time those tomato plants are big and need that space, that basil's already pesto long out of my way. You know what I mean? So for me, that's a really good way for those plants to work together. Okay. Now the last question, what were the uh, tomatoes that you wrote for about in the Baker catalog? I have written a number of stories that you'll find uh, throughout the years in the Baker Creek seed catalog. Um, but just recently, I actually wrote about the Amish paste tomato, um, which can be brought back to a gentleman from Wisconsin named Thane Earl. Um, so it's truly a Wisconsin tomato. And I do believe I saw Amish paste tomatoes on your plant list for your plant sale. Correct. And even though some people consider Amish paste to be like just a standard old paste tomato, it is my number one go-to paste tomato always. And I've grown, I've grown a lot of them. I won't say all of them, but I have grown a lot of paste tomatoes 
from all over the world. And I keep coming back to the Amish paste tomato, the size of it, the meatiness, the flavor, it checks all the boxes for me. It's an awesome tomato. So it was really cool to get to research that story about Thane Earl, who was quite a character um, and kept quite a collection of seeds. I did some research. I went to Seed Savers Exchange in Iowa, where they have a uh, they keep all the seeds in a the vault. They got like 250,000 varieties in this vault. And I was working with them because they had some history about Thane Earl. And just as a side, the one girl says to me, we've got a lot of Thane's collection here. If you're ever interested in any of his tomatoes, let me know. And I said, oh, yeah, sure. Cool. Sounds cool. Or whatever. You know, I didn't even really think about what she was saying to me. And they just recently emailed me just a couple of weeks ago. And they want to send me samples of Thane Earl's tomato collection. And I said, well, that sounds really interesting. Go ahead. And it just showed up the other day. It's three boxes of 900 varieties of tomatoes from Thane Earl's collection is at my house now. Whoa. Whoa is right. So... He's a he's a guy. He's from Wisconsin. So you guys would probably really dig this. Um, I sent the spreadsheet of tomato varieties around to some of my collector friends. And there are varieties of tomatoes on this list. These folks have never even heard of before. Uh, wow. So I think it is quite wow. a treasure trove. So once I get it organized, we should all connect again. And maybe you guys could grow some of those Thane Earl tomatoes. That might be pretty neat. Wow. OK. Mm -hmm. And so the last question. What are your favorite varieties besides the ones we are selling at the plant sale? Oh man, who's my favorite kid, right? Oh gosh. Uh, so my favorite tomato is going to change every year. I guess my favorite tomato is the very first one I eat each year, right? Um, that's the best one. But if I had to pick a favorite, okay. So we've got a tomato that we offer on our website called Old Carolina. And I like it for the story, one. Um, it was some seeds that were given to me. I was in Berea, Kentucky at a seed swap. And this kid said, I found these seeds in my grandma's freezer. Do you want these? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I do. You know? And after some research with the family, the, um, Nell Bryson was her name. She's not alive anymore. Um, the seeds were in her freezer for 65 years, um, before they came to me and I got 10 seeds oh. from this kid and yeah, Wow. Seven of those 10 seeds grew. So 70% germination on seeds that were in a freezer for, for six to five years, wild to begin with. But then the tomatoes, they're these big honking beefsteak tomatoes. They're uh, bicolor, so they're kind of yellowish orange on the outside with a red core. They're gorgeous, big, and they just pump out tomatoes. My experience with big tomatoes is they kind of they show off a whole bunch right away, and then you don't get much out of them after that. And these pump them all the way to frost. Put out, they're awesome. So that's probably my favorite tomato right now, for sure. The old Carolina. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think that's all we have time for questions. Um, do you, can people drive over to your farm and do you sell things from your farm? We don't typically, you know, we used to do um, tours of the, you know, the big woods across the street and stuff like, you know, plant walks or whatever, identify plants or this sort of thing. Um, but then when, I won't say the word, but March of 2020, something happened where we couldn't do that anymore. <laughs> And um, we really haven't brought that back. You know? And a lot of people ask about it, but we haven't much. You can buy everything that we offer online. Um, so you can go to our website. You can find our seeds and, and herbs and books and all sorts of jazz on our website, the smallhousefarm.com. Um, okay. And if you use the coupon code seeds ship free, any seeds or books that you buy, there'll be no shipping for them. That's cool. Thank you very much for that hot tip. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's past your bedtime because you have to wake up tomorrow and figure out what to do with those 900 tomato oh. seeds. And that's true. So I need to get my rest. I got my work cut out for me. But I just want to say thanks again to all of y'all for having me um, hang out with you to thank talk you. about tomatoes. I really had a great time. So thank you all so much. Thank you.